So tonight, with that, our speaker for the night is University of Iowa Professor Ken Gailey. Ken Gailey grew up in Buffalo, New York, and attended Princeton University. Went on to study solar physics at the Institute for Astronomy in Honolulu and the University of California in San Diego, receiving his, receiving his PhD in astrophysics from UC San Diego in 1990. He performed uh, postdoc studies at other universities, joined the faculty of the University of Iowa in 97. Dr. Gailey is an associate professor for astronomy and astrophysics at the University of Iowa. His research interests are in the study of how light carries energy, momentum, and information out of the region where the photons originated. Fortunately for us, he's an active supporter of science education, including educating all of us, which is, as I say, that's fortunate for us. And he's a member of the American Astronomical Society. So tonight, Professor Gailey will talk about the Big Bang. Thanks, John. I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. I know it's a rather cloudy, which has two unfortunate aspects. Number one is you probably won't get a chance to do much observing tonight. And number two, you'll probably have to listen to me a little bit longer because there's less reason for me to get finished so you can get out and do some observing. Okay? So I know there's a few young kids here tonight. They're, they're very brave because uh, this is, uh, I'm not going to be throwing softball pitches tonight, but that's okay. I think it's good to be exposed to uh, the full story. And if you don't understand everything I say, that's not terribly surprising. Because what I'm going to be talking about is the Big Bang model, which is uh, probably the best model that astronomy has ever devised for understanding the history of our universe. And I'm titling it the greatest story ever untold, because although there are great aspects of the story that are told, nevertheless, uh, you, I think you'll find by the end of this there's a lot of questions that remain. There are some very fundamental questions about the history of our universe that we, we really don't get answers to with the Big Bang model. But we do get a lot of very good answers from this model. Now, I also know that you had a talk earlier this year from Dr. Bill Peterson, where he told you about the Big Bang. And many of you may have been here, and many of you may not have. He would have covered more observational aspects. So tonight, I'm going to cover the more theoretical aspects of our understanding. What does this Big Bang model tell us about the nature of space, time, and the history of our universe? So I'm not really going to touch too much on the observations, but if you have questions about that afterward, we can certainly address that. Okay. All right, so here I have a picture of two famous figures from the history of astronomy. On the left, we have Ptolemy, and on the right, we have Galileo. And so the, these two men are juxtaposed because they have very different views about the status of the Earth in the universe. Ptolemy had a model where the Earth was the stationary center of the universe. The Earth, the Earth did not move. Galileo held to the Copernican view that the Earth was not a special place in the universe, and that, in fact, it was moving, just like all of the other astronomical objects. In fact, after he was forced to recant his views in front of the Inquisition, it is said that he, he uttered the phrase, Ephraim sin move, which means, yet it moves. It's, Even though I will recant my views, yet it moves. So what's interesting about that, on the surface, that has nothing to do with the Big Bang. The Big Bang is not about the Earth being the center of the universe or something like that. But it is about movement in the sense of the dynamics. Do we live in a universe that is itself stationary, or is the universe as a whole something dynamical, something changing with time, something in, in a sense that's moving? So does effort see and move apply to the universe as a whole, as well as to the Earth? That is, that is one of the key uh, benchmarks of the uh, Big Bang model, as you'll see it as we go on. So no one can talk about the Big Bang model without showing this picture. This is the picture of the cosmic microwave background. It's seen by the Planck satellite, our latest and greatest satellite for observing this, this image. And it's a little hard to see what this is. This is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional view of the entire universe. So we're looking at all directions. It's like taking a, a map of the Earth and putting it onto a piece of paper. Okay. So you see in that picture all directions. And what you see is the temperature of the light, the cosmic microwave background, that comes from all these different directions. Now I realize that looking at this, it doesn't look like much. It looks like what you see on your TV screen when you haven't got a station plugged in there, right? I mean, it, it just looks like, <coughs> it just looks like noise. 
part of it. So how, how on earth could this be the probably the most important image that astronomy has ever has ever discovered? Well, it is that, and I'll try to give you some sense as to why it is it, it is exactly that. First of all, the, the most important thing to get about this image is you can't really even see from this image, which is that all of the light coming from all different directions is at the same temperature. I don't know if it looks like it's red and blue. These are the variations, and they're magnified. They're only really about one part in 10 to the 4. These are tiny variations. Basically, the zero order understanding here is that it's all the same temperature. <clears throat> so the universe is bathed in light coming from all directions that's at the same temperature. This is believed to be the light left over, the residual, if you will, of a phase of the universe a long time ago when the universe was very dense and very hot. And that's the, the linchpin of the Big Bang model. That over time, the universe gets expanded and cooler, temperatures go down, temperatures go down. But when we see back to an early phase, we see when it was very dense and very hot. Okay? The next thing to get about it is that this light is coming from a truly spectacular distance. Like you might look out at the night sky and see stars and think, okay, it's amazing that that light was emitted a thousand years ago. Typical for stars, a thousand years ago that light was emitted. Or maybe you'll even see the Andromeda galaxy sometime and think, wow, that light was emitted a million years ago. That seems incredibly impressive that I can see the light emitted a million years ago. That's how far away the Andromeda galaxy is. But here, you're seeing light that was emitted 13.8 billion years ago. And the distance it's crossing, the, the gas that emitted this light is now a distance of about 40 billion light years away. Yes, 40 billion is more than 13.8 billion, because in the 13.8 billion years that that light has been traveling to us, the distances have been growing. So now that gas is 40 billion or so light years away. So that's a truly staggering distance that material is away from us, and we're just seeing it now. It doesn't look like material, but that really is hydrogen gas, what you're seeing. This is, these are the emissions that come from hydrogen gas spread out all over the universe. Now the next thing to get about this image that's also amazing about it is that hydrogen gas in the conditions that you're seeing it here should emit light at a temperature of about 3,000 Kelvin, and that is red light. So you should be seeing very bright red light, but you're not. You're seeing microwave light. Microwave light has a frequency that is way less. It's about a thousand times less. That's why the temperature of this light is about 3 Kelvin instead of 3,000 Kelvin. If you're not used to the Kelvin scale, the room is at about 300 Kelvin. The sun is at about 6,000 Kelvin, the surface of the sun. This gas should have been at about 3,000 Kelvin, so almost as hot as the surface of the sun. Yet we're seeing it in the microwave at a temperature of about 3 Kelvin. That means the frequency of the light that we're observing is about a thousand times lower than it ought to be. Hydrogen in these conditions should be emitting light 3,000 times, I'm sorry, 1,000 times higher frequency than what we're seeing. So we need to understand why the frequency of its light is a thousand times less than in some sense it ought to be. And, and that's called a cosmological redshift. And we'll, we'll talk more about why, why that is. So those are the things to get about that image. There's so much here. Number one, it's, it's light that's at a temperature. It's thermal radiation. That's suggestive of its hot, dense, early days of the universe. Number two, it's got tiny variations that need to be explained. We'll cover that. Number three, it's showing up at a frequency that's a thousand times less than it ought to be considering the kind of gas that's emitting that light. So we need to understand all of those things. And what we want to do is we want to take those tidbits of information, along with many other observations that we have at our disposal, and come up with the story of the history of our universe. That's the goal. Now, the story of the history of the universe has been a topic of many cultures throughout the ages. They, they haven't always really attempted to use science to answer that question. But no matter how you do it, you pretty much have three questions to address when you want to give a history. The first question is you, you've got to identify if there's any special places in your story. And uh, for example, does the universe have a center? Is there something special about the Earth? Does it have a bed, a boundary, or an edge? 
or is it infinite in time? You're going to have to address that with your history and story. Are there any special times in your history? In particular, is there a, a creation or an origin of time or a beginning to your story? Or is the universe infinitely old? Is there an end to the story? Those kinds of things come up. And finally, you need to have a flavor to your story. Because you're starting to have a flavor that what happened was inevitable. It had to happen. The universe is this way because it must be. Or is it going to have a flavor of being sort of happenstance? Yeah, it could have been some other way, but it happened to be like this. That's going to be the flavor of my story. Or in some cases, the stories have a flavor of having some intention. Like there was a god or gods that created it, that had an intention for the universe. Is that going to be in our story? Now, when we talk about non-scientific approaches to this, we call these creation stories are often considered myths. So they're passed on from generation to generation. They're not based on any evidence. They're really just stories. And they have things like, you know, the Earth existing on the back of a turtle. And, and yet these, these stories are passed on because they have a place. They, they give people a sense of belonging to something larger. So they, they serve a purpose. They're just not scientific because they don't have any evidence to support them. But oftentimes these creation myths do have certain characteristics, and they do address those three points that I mentioned. They often uh, have the Earth as a special place. That's quite typical for creation myths. The Earth is not like the rest of the universe. It's a very different place, a very special place. And they're usually at a special time, because the creation myths generally have a creation. They usually start with, first there was nothing, and then something happened, and so there was a special time in these uh, creation stories. And finally, uh, they, they, they usually have a, a bit of intention embedded in them, because usually they have God figures that are important in these stories. And so these stories have the intention of some God or God, but they often also have a development of chance. Many of the creation myths that you can hear from different cultures have something happen that just kind of just happened. You know, it could have gone some other way, but this is how it went. So it's kind of a mix of intention and chance, and, and that's often what you see. But we're not really here to talk about creation myths. We're more interested in the scientific approach. So what do you get when you apply the methodology of science? And so you can tell a history story using science. And remember, the key to finding element of using science to tell a story is you need to have evidence. You need to have observations that support each one of the claims that you're making in your story. And so the Big Bang is an example of that type of story. But before we had all these great observations, we still tried to apply scientific approaches. And so the ancient Greeks had some philosophers who tried to put together the pieces of whatever evidence they had at their disposal. And a famous ancient Greek uh, philosopher was named Parmenides. Parmenides had some very interesting ideas that today would seem almost crazy, really. But you've got to remember that Parmenides was coming along at a time when the logic itself was just being invented. He was literally one of the people who was inventing the kind of thinking that we now call logic. And he had no idea how important or powerful logic could be. And he had a feeling that it was very powerful. In fact, he felt that you should be able to figure out the nature of the universe using nothing but pure logic. And so when he applied pure logic, he felt that the universe could not have any special places in it. Because the universe had to be pretty much all, all the same thing. It was just, just one thing. It was the universe. It can't have special places in it. Number two, it can't have any special times. In fact, Parmenides thought that change itself was an illusion. Sort of like if A turns into B, it must be that B was always in A. And when A turns into B, there still has to be some A in B. Right? Because if the change is just an illusion. But he just, he just logically, A does not turn into B. That didn't make any sense. So to him, it'd be like, me walking past you going down the street, at first you see my face, and then later you see the back of my head. You don't think that my face turned into a hairy back of the head. You just think that, you know, it's all an illusion. That I was always me. Change is impossible. But we see different aspects of it. So that's what change was to our entity. So, so there would not be any special times in the universe like that. And finally, it was perfectly inevitable to them. The, the universe had to be the way it was. It was a logical imperative. That was the whole point, was to see what logic forced to be true about the universe. Now, looking at those three answers to these questions, you might think that we've, we've really come a long way away from that way of thinking about things. But by the end of this talk, I'm going to show you that actually, to some sense, 
there's a, there's a sense of coming full circle here. So he, this, these crazy ideas are really not completely gone, as you'll see in a moment. But even for the ancient Greeks, they found that approach to be a bit hard to, to buy. And so it was really Aristotle's views that, uh, that won the day for the ancient Greeks, and his views were a bit different. He, he did think there was a special place in the universe, which was the Earth. Aristotle believed in four basic elements, and Earth was one of them. And, and it was the role of Earth to go to the center of the universe. So that was Aristotle's model of gravity. Gravity was the tendency for Earth to go to the center of the universe. So of course the Earth was at the center of the universe, because that's what gravity does. Puts the Earth at the center of the universe. And everything that is made of Earth goes to the center of the universe. So this is sort of made of Earth. Oh yeah, it's going to the center of the universe. That was his view. So that's a very special place. Okay? But there were special times in Aristotle's cosmology. Cosmology is a story of the history of the universe. Uh, to him, the universe is pretty much the same all the time. People would live and die, and nations would come and go, but the universe just went through its cycles. So the universe itself did not change. So in that sense, he kind of agreed with Parmenides. And he, he also felt it was inevitable. The way the universe was had some inevitabilities to it. For example, he believed that all planets and suns had to be spheres, given the spheres of perfect shape. And in the heavens, things had to be perfect. It couldn't be any other way. There was no chance involved. They were spheres, because they had to be spheres. And they followed the orbits that they must follow. And these orbits must be circular, and there is a little bit of complexity involved there, but uh, by and large, it was all inevitable. And so he believed that everything that happened had a cause. Things were caused to be the way they were. But he didn't really have a whole lot of evidence to support this because the Greeks did not have a lot of observations at their disposal. Fast forward about 1,500 years or so, or longer, and we have the realm of uh, modern science, modern physics. And we have two famous figures in modern physics, Newton and Einstein. And they both agreed originally on a kind of a cosmology. They were not contemporaries, Newton came long before Einstein, but Einstein's cosmology was very similar to Newton's in the following ways. They felt that there had to be a Copernican principle in the universe, which is the principle that the Earth is not a special place, but it is just another astronomical body. So this is very much the view that we hold to this day. But the Earth is just another astronomical body, and it's not a special place in the universe. So the Copernican principle is the principle that says the universe is the same wherever you go. I mean, sure, there are hot stars and cool stars, but those are details. If you sit back and look at the universe as a whole, it's pretty much the same anywhere you go. That's the Copernican principle. No places are special. However, there's still the question of are there any special times. Now both Newton and Einstein didn't think there could be a special time. They didn't think the universe could have a beginning. They didn't think the universe could be changing with time. They thought the universe had to be staying the same, just like the ancient Greeks did. They thought the universe had to be staying the same. Okay? And they, a big difference though is they interjected a large amount of happenstance. And the reason for this is that the laws of physics that Newton came up with and Einstein modified are all laws about how things change. There's a huge shift in what physics does in the modern era. Physics is no longer an explanation for the way things are. It's an explanation for the way things change. So changes are caused. If, if I had A and it turned into B, there needed to be a cause to go from A to B. But there's no first cause. There's no cause of A. There's just a cause that made A turn into B. So we don't explain the way things are with physics today. We explain how they changed into what they are now, given what they used to be. But you have to say what they used to be, or you can't tell the story. You always have to start the story somewhere. And physics never knows where to start the story, because it doesn't have a first cause anywhere in And so that was part of the reason that they thought the universe didn't have an origin because physics doesn't do origins, it does changes. So they wanted a universe that was always the same with time. But you can't have a lot of happenstance there, because even though the changes have reasons and causes, the reason they were the way they were to begin with is, is kind of chance. The, the initial conditions of any situation 
are left up to more or less a chance. So Newton's model and Einstein's model, with cosmology and describing, is not the way the Big Bang works. We've changed quite a bit from that. So what did Newton miss? Well, it turns out that Newton's gravity was extremely powerful. We now have a better gravity from Einstein called general relativity. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Newton's gravity was fully capable of doing a Big Bang. It really was. There was everything in Newton's gravity that you needed for a Big Bang. He didn't have the observations that Hubble did that showed that distant galaxies are redshifted, which suggests that there's something happening as you look farther away and look further back in time. So the Hubble's observations are a suggestion that there's something dynamical going on in the universe. He didn't have that. So in hindsight, it's easy for us to say, you should have realized that the universe could be dynamical, but he didn't. But his theory was based on the Copernican principle, that the universe was the same everywhere. And what he didn't realize is that his own theory of gravity was capable of having a universe that's the same everywhere, yet is changing with time. It's dynamical. Pepper Simbube, the universe as a whole, yet it moves. He didn't realize that because he had a very literal interpretation of the concept of objective reality. What I really mean is the force of gravity. Newton had an idea that the force of gravity was like an arrow that you could put in space. And it had to point in some direction. And that had to be an objectively real thing. And so if the universe is the same everywhere, how does gravity know which direction to point? I'm mean, sure it knows which direction to point for us. We're standing on the Earth. We have a special object right next to us, the Earth. But on the universe as a whole, if everything is spread out equally and everything was the same everywhere, where does gravity point in the universe as a whole? So because he believed that gravity had to be a real thing that could point in some real direction, he didn't think that you could have any universal gravity. It had to be zero. It didn't know which way to point. And if you have zero gravity in the universe as a whole, then there's, there's no dynamics. It doesn't change. It just sits there. It's a stationary universe, just like Ptolemy made a stationary Earth. So we have to ask ourselves, was, was Newton right about this? It, was it really true that gravity needed to be a real objective thing like that? Well, there's a very subtle point here, which is, what kind of objectivity do you really need to do science? What does scientific objectivity really mean? Now, naively, scientific objectivity means that if you do an observation and you get the result X, then that's the truth. Like, if you measure my height, you say, I'm six feet tall. That, that's the truth. I'm six feet tall. I'm a story. Right? That, that's something that's true in the universe. That, that measurement happens to the universe. I'm six feet tall. That, but that turns out to be a rather naive version of objectivity. What you really need, though, is that it's okay to include the frame of reference or the perspective of the observer when you talk about what the result of the observation was. By that I mean, pause and think about this for a second. When an observation is done, it's not necessary for the observer to disappear and vanish into the void. It's okay for the observer to still be on the scene and say, yes, I did this observation. This is the result you get if you're standing where I'm standing and you look the way I'm looking if you have my frame of reference. So I can give you a demonstration of what I'm talking about to make this more concrete. Okay, so watch what I'm doing right now. So here's a ball, golf ball, boom, did that. Do it again. Boom. Because we can all agree what's happening here, right? It's objective, I'm throwing a golf ball. We can all agree that the golf ball is going from the right to the left, right? Golf ball going from the right to the left, right? I mean, no, that's right. not for you. For you, it's not going from the right to the left, it's going from the left to the right. I'm like, wait, are you crazy? It's on the right, it's on the left. I don't know what you're talking about. So what's happening here? Has objectivity broken down? Is it what science is in, in chaos now? We don't have objectivity. No, it's okay to realize that from my point of view, this is going from the right to the left. And from your point of view, it's going from the left to the right. We're not really saying anything different. It's the same objective reality, the same objective truth, seen from two different perspectives. So the way to turn this into an objective thing that we can all agree on is you include the observer. You just say that the golf ball is going from my right hand to my left hand. Now that's something we can all agree on. Golf ball's in my right hand, good. Golf ball's in my left hand, good. 
subjective. <clears throat> so what made that objective? It, it became objective when we accounted for the fact that I have a, a point of view. This is my right hand and my left hand. If you include the observer in the observation, objectivity is restored. Okay? That's a fundamental tenet of the concept of relativity, Einstein's great contribution to this whole question. But Newton didn't quite get that because he was thinking more in terms of type A, where if there was a gravity, it had to have a certain direction, and if it didn't know which way to point, boom. All Newton would have needed to do to come up with a Big Bang model is allow the gravity to be dependent on the observer. Because let one observer say gravity is pointing this way, and some other observer say gravity is pointing some other way. You might think, well, how would that ever work? Well, it would, because one observer would think that all the gravity in the universe is trying to pull the universe down onto their head. And some other observer, halfway across the universe, would think the same thing. They would think that the whole gravity of the universe is trying to pull the universe down onto their head. But they're not really disagreeing, because what would really happen is the universe would come crashing down on both of their heads. The whole universe would just come crashing down. And both of them would see exactly what they expect to see, which is the universe crashing down on their head. Now, we don't actually see the universe crashing down on our heads. But the key point is that the universe is now dynamical. It's the same everywhere, and it's also dynamical. The details of the dynamics are different from falling on our heads, but that's somewhat of a detail. Okay, so there's actually two great theories of the last century, relativity and quantum mechanics. And they both have something to say about why you don't need this sort of naive form of objectivity that every observation is just a real thing and that's it. That you can include the observer in the observation. As I've already mentioned with relativity, you can have two different observers that talk about what they're seeing differently. I'll give you another example of that, by the way. So here I have two balls, and now here's something that we can all agree on. I'm throwing the balls up at the same time. Okay. We all agree, these balls are going up at the same time. Okay. But if an observer was flying past us at, say, 95% of the speed of light, it's kind of hard to find an observer like that, but hypothetically, if there were one, they would not agree. They would not agree that these two balls are being released at the same time. They would think one of the balls was being thrown up first before the other one. Okay? So we cannot say it's an objective truth that these two balls are being thrown up at the same time. It depends on your reference frame. You have a reference frame, I mean, I realize you, you can't know that this is true, but it is. This, this is something that's been tested a million times. Uh, an observer zooming by would, uh, would perceive one of those balls as being thrown up before the other one. So we no longer have an objective truth that the balls are being thrown up at the same time. The objective truth is that I think the balls are being thrown up at the same time. And some observers zooming past think they're not being thrown up at the same time. That's the objective truth. Okay? But because we can translate, relativity gives us a language, a way to translate between different observers. So all the observers can agree on what each other are going to see. They don't think they're seeing the same thing, but they agree on what each other are going to see. That's the kind of objectivity that we actually get to do science. Okay? Now, quantum mechanics is the other great theory of the last century, and it's a very amazing theory. It's a theory designed to treat tiny things like atoms and electrons and so forth. Very surprising characteristics. I could go on for an hour about quantum mechanics, but the only thing I want to say about quantum mechanics today is that it turns out that in quantum mechanics, you don't have hypothetical observations. You don't say, I send particles towards two slits, and the particles go through one slit or the other, I don't know which, it doesn't matter, but it's going to go through one slit or the other, right? It turns out that if you don't actually measure which slit the particle goes through, it's indeterminate which, part, which slit the particle goes through. If there is no apparatus in place that is capable of telling which slit a particle goes through, then nothing can tell you which slit the particle goes through. It's fundamentally indeterminate. So what does that mean? It means that in order for something to be determined in the universe, there has to be an apparatus that determines it. In the absence of an apparatus that determines it, it's not determined. Okay? So again, the observation and the apparatus doing the observation are intimately linked. It makes a big difference if you really have the apparatus there or you don't. Okay? So to, to, to give you some images to sort of repeat these two points, relativity says that your reference frame 
affects how you perceive both time and length. So things like do the two balls work at the same time, that's kind of a monkeying with time that happens in two different reference frames. Or the length. If somebody zooming by me at 95% of the speed of light might think that I'm only three feet tall, not six feet tall. Maybe they'd, they'd be completely right. From their point of view, I'm three feet tall. That's it. So being in a different reference frame changes the way you perceive length and time. And when you send particles through two slits, you get a pattern like this. So this is this is a pattern you'll get if you send tiny particles of any kind. This is light, but it could be any particle. Through two slits. You don't see two bright spots, right? You see a dozen bright spots. There's only two slits here. Why do I see a dozen bright spots? The answer is interference. The possibility that the particle went through one slit or the other is interfering and in producing a complicated pattern. If I detect, if I set up an apparatus that detects which slit the particles go through, then I won't get that interference pattern. I'll just get two spots. If it went through one slit or went through the other slit, because I'm, I have an apparatus that's detecting that. It becomes part of the objective reality that the particle went through one slit or the other. In this case, it is not part of the objective reality that the particle went through one slit or the other. The universe has no idea what slit the particle went through. It doesn't even have an opinion on whether it went through one slit or the other. It needs it to be able to go through, in some sense, both slits in order for it to produce an interference test. So the bottom line is that really quantum mechanics is weird, and that's a whole other area. But the bottom line here is that observations do not live independently of the apparatus that observes them. The reference frame, the act of doing the observation, these are all part and parcel of the result. So objective reality is much more complicated than we realize. <laughs> Now it turns out that it's, uh, that's, it's even more bizarre than that. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little story about what happened to me this morning. It was an interesting thing. I woke up this morning, and I discovered, to my amazement, that I was a thousand times smaller than I'd been the day before. A thousand times smaller I was. But it was very difficult for me to to know how I could see that, or, and I couldn't I couldn't get anybody else to believe me. Now you you might think, well, that's kind of weird. If, surely, if you were a thousand times smaller, it'd be very obvious, right? But the reason it wasn't obvious is because everything else was a thousand times smaller. Also, my bed was a thousand times smaller. My room, my house, the, the car in the driveway. In fact, the entire planet Earth was a thousand times smaller. And not only that, I looked up at the sun, and it was a thousand times smaller too. But it was also a thousand times closer, so it looked exactly the same. And I couldn't get anybody to believe that everything was a thousand times smaller today. It's very frustrating. I noticed something else as well. My, my watch was ticking a thousand times faster than it was the night before. And you might think, well, that, that would be perfectly obvious, wouldn't it? No, but it wasn't because my brain was working a thousand times faster also. And everything was happening a thousand times faster. Right? Things were falling a thousand times faster. People were talking a thousand times faster. Everything was happening a thousand times faster. So it didn't seem any different. And I, I was, again, I was frustrated. I couldn't get anybody to believe that things had been set up by a factor of a thousand. Okay. So now, listening to the story, you might think it's a little bit silly because clearly, if, if I can't have any way to demonstrate that I'm a thousand times smaller and so is everything else, then it's kind of meaningless to even say that I'm a thousand times smaller. But the point of the story is that it makes you realize that lengths are not absolute things. Lengths are always comparisons, and so are time intervals. What is the meaning of six feet? Six feet doesn't have any meaning unless you have one foot. And then you can compare it six feet to one foot, there will six feet is six of those one foot things. So the meaning of six feet is intimately related to the meaning of one foot. And so it's always a, a comparison. All, all things that we mean by length are actually comparisons between lengths. And same thing with time intervals, you know, 10 seconds. What's 10 seconds? I have no idea. Tell me what one second is, and then I understand what 10 seconds is. It's a comparison. All time intervals are comparisons between two different time intervals. You need some sort of a reference time interval in order to give meaning to the concept. So this is another important point about relativity. It's the idea that different observers in some sense own their own observations, and furthermore the scales that they use in their observations, what they mean by a foot, what they mean by a second, can be different. And, it, and we need a way to translate between the observers. And that's what relativity gives us. It's a way to understand what you mean by a second and what you mean by a foot compared to what I mean by a second and what I mean by a foot. 
And the important thing to get here is that you can't tell yourself in your own little world a second and a foot just always doing the same thing. You have to look over the river to somebody else and say, oh, gee, they have a different concept of a foot. They have a different concept of a second. That's exactly what you're seeing here in this picture. Remember I told you that the light coming from this hydrogen gas should be visible red light. It should be at a frequency that's a thousand times faster than it actually is. You, you get it as microwave. What's going on? What's going on is that if you lived back then where this gas was, it would be very hot, you wouldn't like wrong, but if you were there, uh, you would think that that was 3,000 Kelvin light. Because for you, time would be going much more slowly than it is for us. Here we are, 13.8 billion years later, in effect, what's happened is time has sped up by about a factor of a thousand. So when we look back into the history of the universe, we see everything happening in slow motion. We see hydrogen gas that today would be emitting light at 3,000 Kelvin, at very high frequency visible light. When we look back into the past, we see this sluggish, slow hydrogen that's been light in the microwave realm. It's because there's a difference in the scale. There's a difference in what we mean by a second today versus what a second meant 13.8 billion years ago. And that's what gravity allows you to do. That's what relativity allows you to do. So the key thing to get, and I realize this is my, rather mind-blowing. It's hard to completely get your head around this. But the, the key point to realize is what all this is allowing is a model of the way the universe is evolving, such that the universe can be the same everywhere, yet it can change with age. So what is changing with age? The universe is in some sense dynamical. It's changing with time. What is changing? What's changing is the very meaning of a foot, the very meaning of a second. That is what's changing as the universe ages. And that's what relativity allows, because it allows a translation between different reference frames. So think of today's world as one reference frame, and think of this hydrogen gas, which is about 400,000 years after the beginning. That hydrogen gas is in a different reference frame. And its concept of time and space are very different. That's also what we mean when we say that the universe is expanding. Okay, what we mean when we say the universe is expanding is we mean that distances to the faraway galaxies are increasing with age. But wait a minute, didn't I tell you earlier there's no such thing as a distance? Distances are comparisons. So what do we mean that the distances to the faraway galaxies are bigger? We just mean that compared to how far away that gas was back then, it's a lot farther away now. That's all we can really say. So we don't really know if the universe is stretching or if we're shrinking. We would have no way to tell. Maybe our rulers are shrinking. Maybe our planet is shrinking. Maybe our solar system is shrinking. All we know is that when we look to the great distant galaxies, they appear to be farther away today than they would have appeared to be back then. Because the meaning of these distances is changing. It's the scale itself that is changing with time. And Einstein's theory of gravity allows that to happen. It allows for two different reference frames to have different concepts of time and space, as long as they have different gravities. So the universe, it's really the gravity of the universe that's changing. That's the thing that's aging and causing, if you will, these changes in the scale. So, so there's sort of a one way to think of the Big Bang universe, where you just think of the whole universe itself as actually expanding. And that's fine. You're welcome to think of that, most people do. But if you want a slightly more sophisticated view, don't imagine that anything is going anywhere. Just imagine that the scales themselves are the things that are changing. The meaning of a foot, the meaning of a second, that's what's changing with time. And it's changing because that's what gravity does. That is exactly what gravity does. It changes the meaning of a, of a foot and a second. Okay, so this is what Einstein fixed when he comes up with his new idea of gravity. So his idea of gravity is a local person can't see what gravity is doing because gravity changes your concept of a foot, your concept of a second, just like when I woke up this morning. Everything around you is affected by it, so you don't really notice it. You only notice it when you compare your concept of a foot and a second to somebody else, somewhere else. That's when you notice it. And that, has, that turns out that that has dynamical effects. In fact, it, it, it's very subtle, but it causes this behavior. This behavior that you see right here is caused by the fact that an observer up here will perceive time as going by more quickly than an observer down here. It's a very small effect, very, very tiny. 
But it's true. If I climbed up to a mountain top, time would seem to be going by perfectly normally for me. But if I compared it to my twin brother who stayed back down here, it would be as though time was going by faster for me on the mountain top than it was for my twin brother who stayed back down here. The difference is so tiny. This is why you never notice this. You, it's just so small. It's almost imperceptible. I mean, it is, in fact, imperceptible. But nevertheless, it's enough to cause that behavior. Okay? That behavior can be thought of as caused by a change in the meaning of a second as you go up in the gravitational field. So uh, that was Einstein's big change in how gravity works. And there's actually a way that you can think about this. The label for this is called the equivalence principle. But the, the idea behind the equivalence principle is fairly simple. Right now, let me ask you a simple question. How many forces are there on you right now? How many forces are acting on your body right now? How many forces do you feel are acting on your body? And most people, when I ask the question, will say two. There's the force of the chair that's pushing on you, which you can tell. You can feel it in a certain part of your body right now. And then they say, well, I'm not going anywhere, so therefore the forces on me must be balanced. So I only really feel one force, but there must be another which is balancing it, which is the force of gravity. So you invent this thing called the force of gravity. You don't actually feel it, if you think about it. You cannot feel the force of gravity, but you can feel the force of the chair. And so you invent a second force to balance the force of the chair to explain the fact that you're not going anywhere. Because you think you need to explain that fact. Einstein's happiest thought, the equivalence principle, is that if you don't feel the force of gravity, maybe it's because there's no such thing. Maybe there is no force of gravity. Maybe the reason you feel a force on you right now is because you're accelerating. Maybe the force that's pushing you right now is accelerating you through space. Maybe this is the only object in the whole room right now that has no forces on it. One object in this room has no forces. An object with no forces on it will do what we call falling. Falling is the natural state, the state that objects do and have no force on You're not falling. You have a force on you. Where is it coming from? The chair. How do you know? You feel it. Pretty simple story there. Right? So gravity was just kind of an invention of the mind in an attempt to understand why you're not going anywhere. But in Einstein's approach, and it's, it's subtle, I mean, this isn't the whole story, because you have to understand how the scales are changing to different places in the gravitational field. That's how you can explain this, where you can end up feeling like you're staying in the same place, when in fact, you're accelerating. But it's, it's exactly what you think. If you close your eyes right now, you feel like you're being accelerated. And you are. That's exactly what's happening to you. But your brain tells you, no, no, I can't be accelerating it. I just stay in the same place. So you invent this other force called gravity. But what gravity really is in Einstein's picture is it's a changing in the meaning of what things do when they don't have any forces on them. And so it's very simple. What things do when they don't have any forces on them is they fall. Okay? Now, if you give it a sideways speed that's fast enough, it can fall and still not hit the ground. That's called an orbit. That's what the moon is doing. The moon is falling. The moon has no forces on it. It is falling. But it never gets any closer to the Earth because it has a sideways speed which causes it to keep missing. It's always falling and missing the Earth all the time, just like the Earth around the sun. We're always falling toward the sun, but we never get any closer to the sun because we're always missing the sun due to our sideways speed. But the, the key point is that the Earth does not have any forces on it. It's just doing what objects do when they have no forces on them, and that is they fall. Okay. So that's Einstein's view of gravity. Now, the, there's a huge irony here which is getting back to the Big Bang. The huge irony in all this is that Einstein's theory of gravity very naturally allows the universe to be the same everywhere. A Copernican universe, no special place, yet evolving dynamically. It can be the same everywhere and evolving dynamically. His gravity allows that. And he would have known that with his own theory. But he didn't want the universe to be changing. Some sort of a philosophical bias or something that said the universe needed to be staying the same. Probably because he just couldn't get his head around the idea of an origin. And so he put in an artificial term called the cosmological constant, which was designed to keep the universe from dynamically evolving. He had a theory that wanted to make the universe dynamically evolve, even though it was the same everywhere. 
and he had to put it in an artificial term to keep that from happening. And, he, and, that, and this was all before the, the Hubble discovery. So uh, this is what Einstein missed. He missed that efforts in Wuve. He didn't need to have a stationary universe. He could let the universe be dynamic. But for some reason, he was, it was really a throwback to Ptolemaic thinking in some sense. It to the whole universe. That the universe itself had to be stationary. The stationary center of the universe is the universe, right? No, the universe can be dynamical. And, uh, okay. So, the thing that breaks all that is the Hubble discovery. That the farther away you look, you see galaxies that are moving away from us, or they're more rich. And so, a uh, naive view of that is the galaxies are moving away from us, and the farther away you look, the faster they're moving away from us. Which means that there's something dynamical going on. If you look far away, you're looking back in time. If you look back in time, you see something different. You see galaxies that are rich. As I told you before, one way to interpret that is you're seeing back to an era when time was going by more slowly. So there's something happening in the universe that's changing with age. The, universe, the rate at which time is flowing in our universe is changing with age, and we can see that with Hubble, with these redshifts that we look back to. So the Hubble discovery is that the universe is dynamical. It is changing with age, even though it's the same everywhere. And Einstein's theory completely allows that, and you just don't put in a cosmological constant. It's, it's, it's crying out to have that property. And so Einstein kicks himself. Luckily, Einstein is still around at this point. He, he gets to realize his mistake. Shouldn't have put in the cosmological constant. I should have just let the universe be dynamic. So that's the key thing that the Big Bang does. This is the game changer. So the Big Bang model comes up with its own answer to these questions. Are there any special places? No. We, we hold very firmly the Copernican principle that the Earth is not a special place, and every place in the universe is more like the same as every other place in the universe. However, there is a special time, which is that the universe has an origin. It's about 13.8 billion years ago. And it's changing with age. And what's changing with age is the meaning of distances and times. The universe is dynamically evolving, and when we look back to earlier times, we see a universe which was happening more slowly okay, than today's universe. Is it inevitable or is it more happenstance? Well, again, we're still in the Newtonian, Einsteinian physics, which is physics is about changes. Causes are about things that change, not about the way they are. The way they are is not caused, the way they change is caused. So the way they are is kind of happenstance. It just depends on the initial condition. I could, I could run a model. I could, I could put in some initial condition and get a universe. And put in a different initial condition, different universe. The fact that we have the universe we have now, it all depends on the initial condition I put in. It seems like it's rather happenstance. Okay. However, that's not necessarily the final answer, because there is a, a new idea that's out there, which is really right at the hairy edge of what we even call science. In fact, it's arguable that it's gone well past the hairy edge of what we call science. And this uh, theory is called eternal inflation. The idea behind eternal inflation is that the Big Bang expansion is just one example of a process that's happening all over the place. And by all over the place, I mean, I mean, you already think the universe is all over the place, but I'm talking about universes on top of universes. I'm talking about multiverses. Incredible number of universes. Every one of them popping off Big Bang like popcorn in one of those giant movie theater popcorn popping bins. Every one of them. There's another Big Bang all over the place. Okay? That's the idea of eternal inflation. So you might ask yourself, why on earth would anybody want to come up with a theory that incredibly complicated and crazy that there's Big Bangs going off everywhere? Well, the reason is because of this basic problem is that science doesn't do origins. It just does changes. So if you put in the kind of space that's allowed to just have a big bang pop off, then all of a sudden the big bang just becomes a change. It doesn't become an origin. It's, you know, we already have the universe there. It's just now there's a change happening. A big bang is occurring. And the big bangs are happening everywhere. Okay. So if you take that approach, although there's as, as yet no evidence for this, <laughs> but if you take that approach, then look at the answers we get. These are the exact same answers that Parmenides got in the very beginning of this whole process. There's, there's no special places. 
because the multiverse is Copernican everywhere. It's not just Copernican within these big bangs, but it's the, the uber big bangs are all Copernican. I mean, a big bang can happen anywhere. There's no special places in the universe like that. And there's also no special times, because even though each big bang has an origin, the universe itself is always there. It's in a steady state of popping off big bangs. So there, there's no origin of that universe anymore. It's back to being the same all the time. It's popping off big bangs all the time, in just the same way. And, and it's no longer happenstance, okay? because now everything that can happen is happening. Every possible big bang that can occur is occurring. There's nothing to explain. There's nothing, there's nothing left to chance. It's all happening. So it's all inevitable. It's completely inevitable that the universe we have would exist because it's one of the big bangs that can happen. It's going to happen. So that makes it seem very much of a logical imperative, just like Parmenides wanted. He wanted the, the, the truth of the universe to be a logical imperative. And this is connected to a principle called the anthropic principle. The anthropic principle attempts to explain a very surprising thing about our universe, which is that the parameters of our universe, if you look at our theories, we have parameters in these theories like the, the Planck constant, the speed of light, the gravitational constant. These are just measured, measured parameters. We have no idea why these things have a value they do. But we measure them, we stick them in the theory, it all works. But these parameters seem to have values that are chosen in a very strange way compared to the behavior that we see in our universe. Our universe doesn't seem to obey the kind of rules that these parameters ought to produce. But no, I mean, if you take these parameters and combine them in a certain way, you can get a time. Well, it turns out the age of the universe is 10 to the 60 times longer than that time. 10 to the 60. Our universe is 10 to the 60 times older than the fundamental unit of time that we can make from our parameters. What the heck? I mean, the fundamental unit of time we can make for our parameters ought to be the time that the universe changes on. The evolutionary time scale of our universe should be about 10 to the minus 44 cents. It's not. The universe doesn't do anything at 10 to the minus 44 cents. It takes a billion years for our universe to do something interesting. Why is that? It's such a crazy system that the universe is set up in such a bizarre way. So this is called the fine-tuning problem, which is like, why are the parameters so completely out of touch with what you'd expect? And the anthropic principle says that if you have big bangs popping up everywhere, then life, intelligent life, that can ask this question, is only going to be in a few of them. And those few will have very bizarre and unusual properties. So the vast majority of the big bangs aren't doing anything interesting at all that can produce intelligent life. We have to be in the ones that are capable of producing intelligent life. So that's one of the attractions of the eternal inflation idea, is it gets rid of questions like, why are the parameters what they are? Well, the parameters are what they are because there's different parameters everywhere, and we're having to be in the one that can produce us. But it's inevitable. We have to be in the universe that can produce us. So the, the question goes away. So, the scorecard is it's hard to keep track of all these possibilities. You know, if we were to compare the big bangs and eternal inflation, they both agree on the Copernican principle. That's the one thing that seems to be pretty rock solid right now. But they just disagree on everything else. The big bang model has a special time, the origin of the universe. Eternal inflation, man. The universe has always been there. It's been talking about big bangs forever. It, the inevitability of it, the big bang seems very happenstance. We have the parameters we have. Why? I don't know. Eternal inflation, no, no, it's completely inevitable. There would be a universe like that somewhere in the whole thing. There's nothing to explain. And so, as I mentioned before, we sort of come full circle back to Parmenides. But an important thing to get, and I'm not really promoting the eternal inflation idea, because personally, I think it's come a long way away from what we could really call science. Remember, science is supposed to have evidence. Right? It's not just supposed to give us a warm, fuzzy feeling that this story makes sense, like the Earth being on the back of the turtle. That's like, oh, okay, yeah, I like it. Let's go with it. <laughs> you know, this is kind of that same flavor. Yeah. So it's not at all obvious that eternal inflation is science. But it does show us, I think, the important point here, the bottom line, I'm at the end now, is that uh, there's some things about the way science works that are a challenge when you want to tell the story of the history of the universe. If you want to create a scientific creation myth, if that's not a contradiction in terms, then these are the problems that you're going to face. First of all, observers are local. 
right? We do all our observations at a given place in time. We have a reference frame, and it's local. And yet we're going to try and somehow weave together all these local answers into a global story. And I'm sure you got the sense that how tricky that is when you have relativity that says we got to translate between the different observers. We can't just take the observation to some given absolute truth. But we got to figure out how the observer's perspective is affecting that observation. And now we got to take that and somehow weave it together into a global story that works for the whole universe. That's a challenge. That may not even be possible. Second of all, science today does not do origins. It does evolution. It does changes. So you've got to tell me what it was, and I'll tell you what it will be. That's all the laws of physics are currently capable of doing. And finally, that picture I showed you of the cosmic microwave background is as far up as we can see in the age of the universe. That, that's the farthest distance that light can go in the age of the universe. So we have seen as much of this universe as we are ever going to see. We may see it better. We'll see it with better instruments in the future. But we're not going to see any farther than that. So that's it. That's what we get. That's the piece of this universe that we get. And it's probably a whole lot bigger than that. I mean, it's almost certainly a whole lot bigger than what we can really see. So what's out there beyond what we can really see? That's the fundamental limitation. And we're, we're just never going to know that. So we, we have a lot of questions that are go unanswered with the Big Bang model. And, and there's just nothing that we can do about it. I'll give you a few of these. Uh, I, I mentioned the fact that uh, there's no way to adjudicate the issue of whether space is really expanding or whether we're shrinking. It's just a comparison between scales. That's, that's all you ever get. We, we won't know if the universe is really Copernican beyond as far as we can see. We know that in the realm that we see, the so-called observable universe, everything is pretty much the same over where you go, but it's aging, it's changing with time. Well, what about beyond what we can see? Is it still the same, or does it turn into something else? Is there really a turtle out there somewhere? <laughs> you know, we, we're never going to know that, because we're never going to see farther than we've already seen. Could there really be these multiverses? Could there be these other universes? Well, we're not going to see them. We might be able to make predictions based on assuming that they're there. We might be able to make sense of observations if we assume that they're there. They make the fine-tuning problem go away via the anthropic principle. But we're never really going to see them. So that's a fundamental limit on what science is capable of doing. So it could be at the end of the day that if we really want the final answer to where the universe came from, we're still back to the origin, the origin, because science is limited. As great as the Big Bang model is, it still has a limitation. Okay. That's what I'm going to say. I'd be happy to answer questions, but I'm sure that uh, you, you may have many. So if there's any more time, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, uh, and I think unfortunately it's cloudy. I don't think we'll be able to do a whole lot of observing. Well, if there is some spots in the clouds, we'll try some. If not, uh, feel free to wander about, uh, go see the big telescope. Uh, we're around to answer any questions about the club, and certainly feel free to, to stay here and uh, ask, her, ask uh, Professor Gailey any questions you have. Yeah, go ahead. What are the latest theories of gravity? I've, I've understood that gravity was, you know, they were looking for a particle. Okay, excellent question. So the question is, what is the latest theory of gravity? Yeah, a, a good point is that I, I, I've been telling you about our best current theory of gravity, which is Einstein's theory of general relativity. But there's a lot of people that don't think general relativity is the final answer. And the reason for that is quantum mechanics, the other great theory of modern physics, is uh, and not completely in agreement with the gravity. I mean, they actually don't make any different predictions because they, they work in two totally different realms, but they just don't fit together. There's no way that both of those theories are right in some absolute sense. So people think that quantum mechanics is probably the writer of the two, and for no real reason. There's no evidence that quantum mechanics is the writer theory of the two. They just kind of feel like it ought to be. And if that's true, then gravity needs to be replaced by a theory that looks more like quantum mechanics. If you're going to do that, you need a particle called the graviton, which has to be the particle that mediates the gravitational force. And so if that's true, then a lot of what I said about gravity turns out to not be true. 
that gravity is no longer something that emerges from relativity. It's more, it's more like the other forces. So that's the, the object of there is unification. If, if gravity can be unified with the other forces, then there's no longer a special way to map between the scales of different observers. Instead, it becomes a particle, just like everything else. In some sense, it becomes much more mundane. But, uh, but there is an important effort to try to unify gravity with the other forces. So far, unsuccessful. So you know, why is that? Is it unsuccessful because we're barking at the wrong tree? We should have left gravity alone when Einstein came up with it? Or uh, is it, just, it just hasn't worked yet and it will in the next five years? I, mean, I, I have no idea. I mean, what's the likelihood of, the, of that with, with modern science? And, yeah, I don't know about the particle accelerators. Right. Do I yeah. Think of this? So yeah, I don't. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never heard much in the way of, a, of an observational search for the graviton. Most of it is theoretical. For some reason, I, I don't know. The, the idea is that if a graviton is ever turned into a workable theory, it will come from some equation or something that makes sense of everything rather than an experiment that says, aha, here's the graviton. But I'm not really sure why that's true. And I, I, couldn't, I couldn't speculate on the probability that it will, that it will work, because I don't know if gravity is unified with the other forces. It may be something fundamentally different. Yeah, but that's a good question. Yeah, go ahead. What can you say about our Big Bang and the longevity of our particular universe? OK, excellent. So you, you want to know about the future of our universe as part of the Big Bang? OK. So there's, there's actually, and I'm glad you asked that because there's a couple of points that I didn't have time to mention, which is, they're kind of details, but they're hugely important details, which is when you, when you put in, when you have a dynamical theory of how the universe evolves with time, you need to put in some pieces, like you need to put in how much mass is there, because the mass is causing the gravity. And it turns out when you do that, you put in the mass of the stars and the hydrogen gas and so forth, it's not nearly enough. There's a factor of 10 more mass that you need. And we have no idea what this mass is. It's, it's most of the mass of the universe, and we have no idea what it is. It's called dark matter, simply because it doesn't seem to make light. It doesn't make stars. You can't see it. We should really call it invisible matter, because it's, it's not dark. It's invisible. But it seems to be 90% of the mass of the universe. We have no idea what dark matter is at the moment, trying to figure it out, but don't know. We just know we need it to make the story work, OK? But there's an even bigger problem which is that also to make the story work, we need something called dark energy, which is doesn't even have anything to do with math. It's true in empty space. Empty space has dark energy. And dark energy makes the universe expansion want to accelerate. So I mentioned before that Newton's model of gravity in the universe could be pulled down onto our heads. That could be avoided by having an expanding universe. But dark energy actually does the opposite. It's like an anti-gravity that tries to make the expansion of the universe accelerate. And observations show that that is, in fact, happening. They're, they're pretty uncontroversial right now. They, are, they could be wrong, but it's grow, I mean, there's a Nobel Prize that's been given out on this, that the universe is accelerating its expansion. So the answer to your question, then, is if, if dark energy turns out to really be right, the expansion of the universe has passed the tipping point where the dark energy is now taking over. And the emptiness of space wants to expand. And so it will expand forever. In fact, it will expand faster and faster and faster forever, unless some new physics kicks in. How do I know that some new physics won't kick in? I don't. I have no idea. But so that's, that's the problem with science. You have your current understanding. Our current understanding is this expansion is going to go on forever, which is not going to be all that exciting for our universe in another 100 billion years. No new stars will form. I mean, there's just not going to be anything going on in this universe of any interest in 100 billion years from now. But uh, maybe some new physics will kick in in 100 billion years that we don't know about. Or maybe our universe really is a part of the multiverse. So if our universe is doing anything interesting, some other universe will be. Yes, sir. Do you expect there to be any alteration between expanding space and shrinking matter? Yeah, good question. So, I and if, there, and if there isn't, right. then would that be a valid question? Right. Yeah, I, I would say the second half of your question, he was asking if, uh, if my hypothesis is correct, that there's not going to be any way to tell the difference between uh, expanding space and shrinking matter, then the question becomes moot. And I, I completely agree. That's right. If, if science has no way to adjudicate the question, then it's not a question that science can even ask. It, it's kind of like, uh, 
we need a new understanding that doesn't attempt to distinguish those two possibilities. However, the second part of your question offers the possibility that maybe there can be some way to distinguish those possibilities. Such as, like, I said that if, if, if I woke up this morning and everything really was a thousand times smaller, I couldn't tell. But, if I can look back across the universe and see the cosmic microwave background, then I can tell. Because, because yesterday isn't gone. You might think, well, gee, I can't compare today to yesterday because yesterday's gone. Not in astronomy, it's not. Yesterday isn't gone in astronomy. It's still there. Because we see it far away. And that means we're seeing back in time. So in astronomy, we do get to see yesterday. And we do see the comparison of scales between today and yesterday. But we still can't tell the difference between, all we get is a comparison of scales. We don't know which is the one that's responsible, or if the question even makes any sense. But, you know, I wouldn't rule out the possibility that there might someday be a way to tell the difference, which requires a different theory that, that puts more importance on the size of the thing than the theory we have now. Yes, right. If you had a tricky universe, then mm -hmm. wouldn't everything eventually move from tricky matter, excuse me? Yes. Doesn't um, everything uh, go to a quantum level at some point? Well, actually, it, it wouldn't, and that's a, that's a very important question, because when the matter is shrinking, it's only shrinking relative to the distant galaxies. But it's entire, in terms of the internal physics of the atoms, it wouldn't be any different. It'd be like our solar system could be shrinking, and the Earth could be shrinking, and the Sun could be shrinking, and the distance between them could be shrinking. But the, the equations of physics that determine the orbit of the Earth around the Sun would never change. We'd still be just as far from the quantum domain. Like the Earth right now is way far from the quantum domain. So the, I guess the best answer to your question is, if the Earth were shrinking, then the quantum domain would also be shrinking. And so we wouldn't be getting any closer to the quantum domain. Because cause if there's nothing real about the shrinking of the Earth that I'm talking about. It's just a comparison. The Earth is shrinking relative to what? It's not shrinking relative to atoms. They're, they'd also be shrinking. It's shrinking relative to the distant galaxy. And the distant galaxies don't have anything to say about the quantum domain. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't cause any problems. In fact, there is some advantage, it's not the standard language, certainly, but there are some advantages to this picture because a common question you get if you say that the universe is expanding is people ask, what is it expanding into? Right? What is expanding? I mean, if the universe is everything and it's expanding, What's it expanding into? Right? What's out there beyond the universe to expand into? Well, then you just sort of say, okay, the universe isn't expanding. Matter is shrinking. And nobody asks, what is matter shrinking into? Because there's nothing down there to shrink into. I mean, it, it, although your question does address essentially that. But if you think that there's a quantum domain waiting for you that you're shrinking into, then there would be something there. But if the quantum domain shrinks as well, there's nothing to shrink. Into. You can just keep shrinking forever. You never know the difference. Oh, is this a, a hypothesis being yeah. actively investigated? Well, well, you know, there's, the problem is there, there's no way to, to investigate the hypothesis because the hypothesis is no different. The, the claim that the universe is expanding is a hypothesis that can't be investigated. There is no observation that looks any different. If I say space is expanding and matter is staying the same size, or if I say that matter is shrinking and space is staying the same size, there's no observation that distinguishes those two. There's no way to tell the difference. So it's a completely moot point because they're just comparisons of scales. And however, you can do observations that compare the scales. You can say, aha, the cosmic microwave background looks like it's a thousand times slower than time is going by today. But we don't know if that's because time has sped up by a factor of a thousand, or if it, if it was just going slow back then. You know, we don't know which is the one that's responsible. Is it the clock? Are the clocks going slower and time itself is going by normally, or for what? So it, the bottom line is that what we think of as a scale is always just a comparison. It's never a real thing. There is no such thing as a length or a time. They're just they're comparisons. And, and that's all we're really capable of doing. Because how do you measure a length? You compare a length to a ruler. It's a comparison. Same thing with a time. You measure a time by comparing it to a clock. Yeah, question, right? Why did God make the world? Ah, okay, so why did God make the world? So I, I, I'm very glad you asked that question because what we, what we need to do with a question like that is say, is this a question that belongs in the realm of science or is it a question that belongs in a different realm? And so if it belongs in the realm of science, here's how you tell. What objectively testable conclusions can you draw based on your answer to that question? If, you're, if you answer A or B and you have A or B different objectively testable conclusions, 
that's a question for science. If you don't, if you answer A or B, and there's no objectively testable ramifications, then it's not a question for science. So I would argue that particular question is in the latter category. That's not a question that science has the slightest idea how to address. So you might ask me what my personal opinion is of that. But it wouldn't make any difference. It wouldn't be any better than yours or anyone else. Everyone is allowed to have their own opinion to the answer to that question. It's simply not a scientific question. So all of my expertise, the reason I'm at the front of this room, is only because I have a history of doing science. That's it. So I have no authority whatsoever to comment on any question that is outside the realm of science. Okay. And, and that's a very important point, though. When you're talking about the history of the universe, you have to say, this is the scientifically determined story. But you're welcome to believe any story you want, because that's a personal kind of thing. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Does the uh, insight uh, of entropy add any uh, additional insight? Okay, so entropy is about uh, the number of different ways that things can happen. It's, it's connected with the concept of randomness. So we say that and it, entropy is a very subtle topic. Because what entropy really means is when we use language to describe something, how vague is that language? If I say that my office is messy, what does that mean? It doesn't mean much. There's a million different offices that might be messy. They don't look anything like my office. So saying that my office is messy is not saying very much. That means it's a high entropy kind of language. Language that just isn't specifying much means there's lots of possibilities. That's called high entropy. Low entropy means there's not a lot of possibilities. So if I use very specific language to describe my office to you, then I'm describing a low entropy situation. And so so the natural order, the natural way things evolve is they go from very specific situations to more general situations. Because if, if I can't predict exactly how the universe is going to change, I have to allow it to be a whole bunch of different possibilities. So this, this turns out to be what we call the second law of thermodynamics, that entropy increases. It just means that you go from a very specific knowledge of everything that's going on to a lot of uncertainty about what's going to be going on. Certainty evolves into uncertainty. That's a way to say the second law of thermodynamics. So that will be happening in the universe as well. So the universe as a whole, there's a lot of uncertainty right now in the universe, but if we were to go out and measure where everything is, soon we get pretty uncertain as to where everything's going to be. So the entropy of the universe will evolve in time. So the, the, the Big Bang doesn't really have any problem with entropy. It's uh, Largely, most of the expansion that's happening doesn't change the entropy because most of the expansion is rather predictable. But on top of this predictable expansion, you have unpredictable stuff increasing the uncertainty. So the second law of thermodynamics really is kind of on top of the Big Bang. But it's not really directly related to the Big Bang. The most theoretical treatment of the Big Bang is one that doesn't increase anything. Yeah, go ahead. So is the maximum entropy within the region proportional to the region's volume or to the surface area of the sphere closing that region. Yeah, if, if the latter is the case. Right. Does that relate to the holographic principle? Yeah, so, yeah, so you're alluding to the holographic principle, which is an idea, it's a modern idea that the information contained in the volume could be encoded on the surface of the volume. So it's a very technical area, and it relates to the entropy of a black hole, which is in fact proportional to the surface area of the black hole. So the holographic principle kind of comes from the idea that a black hole contains a lot of information inside it, but that information is lost to our universe. So how did that happen? How did our universe lose information? Well, if you say that that universe, that information is in some sense encoded on the surface of the black hole, then it's not lost to our universe. And so that was kind of the origin of the, of the holographic principle. But uh, it's a pretty technical point. Uh, I'm not sure if I can comment too much more about it. But it's just, it's about the, the amount of information. It's the number of possible states, which relates to the number of questions you'd have to answer to tell me what's going on. It has to do with entropy. The number of questions you'd have to give me answers to to tell me what's happening. Yeah. Then, if one can encode information about the uh, volume Mm -hmm. 
I don't know. The question was about uh, if the holographic principle is true, then all of the information that is contained in what we call the, observ the observable universe could also be encoded on the surface of the observable universe, which we call the horizon, as far as we can see. And so, uh, if, I, I don't really know what ramifications that would have if you could put that information on that surface and, and have it in some way affect the expansion. I don't know. I don't know if there's a. I mean, that's that's getting into areas of of new physics that uh, I really couldn't comment on. Yeah. Going back to that picture of that microwave background. Yeah. Is all the point basically the center? I mean. Same distance from us? Yes. You, yes, yes. All these points are the same distance from us. We're at the center of a giant sphere. And this light came to us from the outside of that sphere. So this is a question a lot of people have. They have the question of, well, well how come there's still light? If this light was emitted 13.7 or 13.8 billion years ago, why isn't it gone? Why hasn't it escaped from the universe? And the answer to that is, you got to stop. You don't want to think of the universe as a finite thing, like an A, a cosmic A. Bad way to think about the universe. Just think of the universe as infinite. We don't know if the universe is infinite or not, but none of our observations tell us that it isn't. So it's okay to just imagine that it is. So if you imagine that the universe is infinite, there's always light coming from somewhere. You, you never run out of light. The, the light is coming from everywhere in this infinite universe. So we see this light from all directions. It was emitted from gas that is now on a gigantic sphere that is about 40 billion light years away from us. And that sphere has just been expanding with the age of the universe. And uh, some other alien, some alien that's halfway across the universe will see a very similar picture to this. It won't be the exact same picture, the variations will be slightly different. But it'll be a very similar picture. But they'll be seeing totally different light. They'll be seeing light coming from a different sphere. It's just that this is the sphere we get to see. So an important assumption that we make is that our sphere is just as good as their sphere. Maybe it's not. Maybe there's an alien out there that sees a sphere that has like a, a hand waving in the middle of the picture. Who knows? We don't know. We, we don't get that sphere. That's the sphere we get. But we assume that, I mean, that, that looks like a pretty generic sphere to me. And so we assume that all the other aliens will be seeing something. Oh, it's kind of a lot like that. Yeah. Is there any way to predict our position in the universe? Yeah, there, all we can do is uh, ask ourselves if we need to think that we're in a special place. And we don't. So if the Copernican principle works fine, we don't need to think of ourselves as being in a special place. So we make models where we're not. So we make models where our position in the universe doesn't really mean anything because it's a completely arbitrary place. And anywhere else, somewhere five billion light years from here, there's some other guy with 12 tentacles and five eyes or something. And he's, he or she is talking to an audience, showing the picture must go on like this. Right? That's, that's the idea about the Copernican principle. Okay. Yeah. One final question. Uh, I heard that uh, a graduate student uh, went through Einstein's mm -hmm. equation of the story that he didn't need a constant. So he wrote him a letter. Yeah. And then Einstein went back, and then that's when he came to grips with quantum mechanics. With him, uh, yeah, I don't know about the details of that story, but it does raise an important issue which I didn't mention, which is although Einstein viewed the cosmological constant as a blunder, because it's so ironic that he had the theory that would allow the universe to be dynamical right in front of us. And yet, just like Ptolemy, he went back to a bias that it couldn't be, that it had to be stationary. And so he put in this cosmological constant to achieve a purpose that was never necessary. Then along comes dark energy. And what is dark energy? Dark energy is an anti-gravity. Well, that's exactly what Einstein put into his model. He put it in to keep it all from falling in. It's like a balancing anti-gravity. And the value of the cosmological constant that we now have for dark energy is very similar to the one Einstein put in. So Einstein's error is back. But it's for a totally different reason. It's not, it's not to make the universe not dynamical. It's to make it even more dynamical than it already is. So it's very ironic. Unfortunately, Einstein wasn't around for dark energy, so he doesn't know that. But he, he went through his grave thinking it was his greatest error. Thank you all.
Thank you.